Good morning, Calvary Chapel. It's good to be with you guys. We're just going to this week pick it up uh, where we left off in the Word, going through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And so we want to pick it up in John chapter 6, verse 41. If you want to turn your Bibles there, and then let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless this time together in His Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning that we have Your Word and that Your Word gives us life. We thank You, Lord, that we can know You in Your Word. And by your word, we thank you, Lord, that everything we need for life and godliness is found inside your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you, Lord, that your word can do in our lives what nothing else can. So, Father, we bring our hearts before you this morning as your children. We ask, Lord, may you have your way in us as your church. You know every individual heart, every individual circumstance, every individual need. And so, Father, we want to pray that you will minister through your Holy Spirit as only you can do that. Lord, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So John chapter 6, verse 41. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then he says, I've come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. And this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of the Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats his bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who do not believe. And who would betray him. And he said, Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you the twelve and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. What does it take for someone to reject Jesus Christ? Well, for some people, not much at all, because they are completely living for themselves. They are self-consumed. You see, they don't even hear Jesus at all. If you look at the parable that Jesus told of the sower, you know, they were the ones with the hardened hearts, the hardened hearers, on which the word of God has no effect. There's no interest in their life or the things of God. The seed that fell on their heart, according to Luke 8 verse 5, is the seed that fell on the wayside, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Then Jesus also in this parable mentioned that the enthusiastic hearers, those who respond initially with joy, they're excited when they hear the word of God, but because of their shallow roots, because of the rock surface underneath, there's not much earth. There's a shallowness and they can't put down roots and then they fall away. You see, they don't reject Jesus outright, but as soon as things get tough, then they're out of there. And then the majority, I think, of people fall into the category of the preoccupied years. You know, those are the ones whom the thorns choke. The thorns, the cares of this life, they choke out the word of God and then eventually they go. Many people today, you know, they don't want Jesus simply because they cannot see their need for him. Like why? What do you mean salvation? Why do I need a savior from what? And that's why I believe God allows things like this coronavirus out of his love for the world to show us that we have a need, to show us that we need Jesus Christ. And some people are still skeptical. They say, well, I don't just believe anything. I need proof. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, what more proof do you want than the things we've been looking so far in the Gospel of John? 
Just to recap, to track back a moment with you there, the people at this stage, they were enthusiastically following after Jesus. They were flocking to him. They were, have a messianic expectation at this, at this stage in history. And they were excited. They're like, this must be the Messiah. And so they were flocking. If he, went, if he goes to this side of the lake of Galilee or the Sea of Galilee, they were there. And then he goes to this side and everyone flocks. They follow him all the way there from side to side of the sea. But we saw that they wanted him for the wrong reasons. They wanted him for their own selfish reasons. You know, they wanted to see signs. They wanted to see miracles. And they wanted to continue being fed. Jesus just fed 5,000 people the last time. And so they wanted more food. Then Jesus truthfully told them. He says, you are seeking me for the wrong reasons. You're just seeking me because of what you can get from me. You don't really want me. And he warns them in the previous chapter we looked at not to work for food that perishes but for the true food he said to them in verse 27 don't live for this life only then he told them very plainly i am the bread of life really saying to them believe me seek me i'm the way the truth and the life and you would think at this stage after everything that they've seen after everything that's happened after everything that that Jesus taught them that at this stage they would just say, Jesus is the Savior, and run to him. But sadly, this is not the way that the reality played out. As soon as they saw that they're not going to get what they want from him, they rejected him. So today, if you're taking note, rejecting the Son of God, and, and this to me is an absolutely crazy concept, that anyone would reject the Son of God, but it all starts with doubt. And so if you're taking note, the first thing you can write down there is doubting Jesus. Look with me at verse 41. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So the Jews were the leaders. Remember, they were sent from Jerusalem to come to him with question, question him about the things that he's doing according to Matthew chapter 15. Remember, they asked him, for a sign, <laughs> in verse 30, just right after he fed the 5,000 men. And you're thinking like, oh, come on, guys, what more sign do you want than that? But they were saying like, if you are the prophet like Moses. Moses gave us our fathers in the desert. He gave them manna continually. It wasn't a once-off thing, so we want to continue having food from you, not just once-off. But guess what? Jesus didn't come to feed our stomachs. He came to give us eternal life in himself. But it says they complain. Now that's an interesting Greek word. It's the word gonguzo. And it means murmuring. It means grumbling. It's sort of like softly whispering among each other. So why were they complaining? Because Jesus said that he is the bread of life that came down from heaven. And so now the guys are standing there and they're whispering in doubt. They're talking among each other. And it's interesting to me at this stage that they were complaining because it's exactly what the fathers did in Israel in the desert. They were murmuring right before they received the manna in Exodus 16 verse 2. So it's amazing to me how the enemy uses doubt to get us to doubt everything about God. He gets us to doubt God's goodness, God's forgiveness, everything in the scripture that teaches about God. That's why Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So they haven't been listening to Jesus now at all. The last thing they heard is he said, I am the bread of life, and they cut out. So for the last five verses or so, they were not tracking with him. And this is something that I sometimes see on a Sunday morning. You know, you you go through the word of God and you teach and there's something that some, you say something and people get stuck and they're like, can't believe he said that. <laughs> and then at the end of the Bible study, they come and say, hey, but you said that. And I'm like, what about all the rest? Did you hear anything about the rest? So it's interesting to me because they complain just in unbelief, just like their fathers. They had doubt. Verse 42 says, and they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, his father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? So remember, this is a small village. These are small villages around the, the top side there, the northern part of the, the Sea of Galilee. And everyone knows everyone. So a lot of these people, they've seen Jesus grow up, especially the ones who are now flocking in. And they're like, hey, but 
we know this Jesus. We saw him as a kid, you know? And the thing is, doubt was the stumbling block that tripped them up. It's, it's what we call the wiles of the devil, according to Ephesians 6, verse 11. You know, it's a trick or a scheme that the devil uses to stumble people. They say, we know him. Well, did they really know him? No. They were so focused on his existence in Nazareth as a boy, they forgot that he really was born in Bethlehem, according to what the prophets spoke. They missed out on that miraculous part of his life in the beginning. They assumed they knew him, but they were completely wrong because he was and is the Son of God. They said there, how, can he, how is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? <laughs> I'm thinking, how is it possible? You know, it's not even logical. And that's another thing there, logic, human logic. It's another trick that the devil uses sometimes. Let me ask you, how many people have doubted God or God's word because of human logic? Did you ever stop to think, if God was small enough for us to comprehend, to understand him with our little human mind, then he would not be big enough to be the God that we believe in. So they forgot what God said. God told them very clearly in the scripture, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are um, your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, God doesn't operate on our level. He doesn't fit into our little box that we oftentimes want to put him in. We were like, this is God, this is how God works. No, God does not fit into any man's box. But really, they knew what it meant if someone said, I've come from heaven. They knew that he was identifying himself with God, and they knew that he was proclaiming his deity, and it was just a difficult thing for them to get around. Look at verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I'll raise him up at the last day. So just like the fathers did, Jesus now says, do not murmur. And they were just going like 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 told us about the fathers that couldn't enter the promised land. You know, murmuring is always useless, especially when you murmur against the Son of God. The thing is, the more you murmur, the more you doubt, the more you question and reject the words of Jesus, the more difficult will be your understanding. And so Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 and 4, he says to us very clearly, the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You see, the more you doubt Jesus, the harder it becomes to get saved. Look at verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up for the last day. So Jesus is speaking about that resurrection life that we spoke about last week on Resurrection Sunday. He's a promise that he will raise those up who come to him. But he says, unless the Father draws him. Now, this has been confusing for many people throughout the years because they've come to this idea that God only draws some people, certain people, and not others. Well, let me tell you, that's absolute nonsense. It's like not what the Bible teaches at all. Do not be confused about this. Jesus is not trying to tell them, my father only picks some and he doesn't pick others. He's trying to tell them, listen to me. I am the word of God that is speaking to you. There's life in me. He's trying to get them to hear him because he is the one sent by the Father, even as he says in this verse here right before us. So let me ask you, how does the Father draw us? Through his word. Through his word. That, and now specifically in context, through the living word, Jesus Christ, that he sent, according to John 3, 16. You see, God sent his son into the world because of his love, that they may hear him, that they may be drawn towards God. And, you know, it's not just some people, everyone, the whole world. And in context, listen to what he says there in verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Jesus is quoting here from Isaiah 54 verse 13. You see, the Father draws the world 
through his word, by his word. And in context, now Jesus is the living word. He says in John 5, 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. That's very important because some false teachings out there today, especially in our area, um, have come to my ears this week too. And it says that we get to the truth of God by sitting together and talking about the things of God and about the word of God. You know, in their own words, they said, no one is perfect knowledge, so we, sh we just keep distilling the truth as we meet in the spirit. No, that is not what the word of God teaches. They are completely missing the point because there is one who has perfect knowledge and he is Jesus Christ. And guess what? He has already spoken. John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's how God draws people to himself. You see, God has spoken through his word. We just have to take it in. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You see, it's all the word of God. This is how we get better understanding by getting into God's word and let the word work in us by the power of his Holy Spirit that he has given us as a church. After all, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen to that. Faith comes by hearing. Faith doesn't come by discussing or talking about God's word together. Faith comes by hearing God's word and accepting it as the truth. That's how people get into false teaching, by hearing each other out, by listening to other people's opinions. That's the one way that you will fall into false teaching. That's why I always tell people, do not run to the web to find the answers. Look to the Word of God. It's only the Word of God. He says there, they shall be taught by God. It's not about anyone else's opinion. You see, that's why God has specifically gifted some offices in the church to teach people the Word. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, he says very clearly, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's why we're sitting here studying the word to, to, today. We're not in an open forum where everyone has a say to what they think that means or how they want to apply it in their life. This is the word of God, and we want to have it speak for ourselves. At Calvary Chapel, it's one of our main distinctives. We don't take a verse from Scripture and teach on it. We don't, take, we don't have something that we want to say and then go and find verses to support what I wanted to say because then you can make the Word of God say anything. We just teach the Word itself. Just straightforward as it is because God's Word is powerful and by His Holy Spirit, He will apply it to our hearts and our lives. He will accomplish what he sent it to do. So we only need the word. We don't need to talk about it to get a better understanding about this. And so even in this situation right here, right now in Capernaum, where Jesus is in the synagogue, there's a huge confusion at this moment. There's huge, they are contradicting themselves because they, as the Jews, are claiming to have a relationship with the Father, but they are rejecting Jesus Christ, the word of God. That's impossible. It's impossible to have a relationship with a father if you reject his word. It says there, Jesus speaking, he says in verse 45, and everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. That is true logic. That's those who respond to the teaching of God's word, the ones who are really the ones who draw near to Jesus. In John 6, 29, a bit earlier, Jesus said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. You see, the problem is that many people go by their own ideas. There's a lot of ministries that start because people think, this is my initiative. I want to do this thing. I'm going to get that. I'm going to do that. No, the ones who are sent by God, those are the ones that God has chosen to use. It's very important. John 5, 43, Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. In John 7, 16, Jesus says, My doctrine is not mine, but him who sent me. 
You see, a lot of people go out in their own power and their own strength. They're not sent, but then people listen to them. But we should just teach the word of God. Jesus says, if you're really listening to the Father, you would believe me because he sent me. Look at verse 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Only Jesus Christ has seen the Father. That's why his word alone teaches us the truth. No one else needs to speak. Only he has spoken. You see, many false prophets have gone out into the world. The Bible tells us very clearly in 1 John 4, 1. The test is always what they say about Jesus Christ. So Jesus is again saying, if you're really listening to God, God is revealing me. Verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. This is a fact. It's another radical claim that Jesus proving his deity. You see, we're not saved by our works of the flesh. We're not saved by our own efforts, by anything that we can do. Not by church membership. You are only saving by believing Jesus Christ as he re is revealed in the word. Verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. This is a repetition. He's just telling them the truth of God's word again so that they can be saved. He wants the world to be saved. He's saying to them, I am the true food. You see, that's the way that God does it. He doesn't argue about his word. He doesn't say, okay, come, let us reason. Let us discuss these things in my word. He simply just gives the word again that he's already spoken to them. And this is what is essential. We have to understand. You need Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. And so he uses bread as an example because it was the plain basic food that you need for nourishment. You see, bread in those days was not like bread in the day that we are living in with all this gluten and impurities and plastics in. It was, it was good solid food. It was the basic solid staple food. Today, many people have become foodies. And, you know, many people have become spiritual foodies, I would say, unfortunately. They run after the things that taste so nice. Oh, have you tasted this? Oh, have you tasted that? You know, I've had this great experience here. I've had this great, oh, you have to taste this. And they keep running, you could say, from cake to cake. They don't really care for the plain, basic teaching of God's word. They want something exciting, something that stirs their palate. You see, bread may not be as exciting or taste as good as cake, but bread will nourish you. Where cake is full of sugar and impurity, it's not nourishment. In the same way, the word of God, you know, it may not taste as good to your palate as the things that appeal to your flesh. You know, the false teachers always speak about things that you like to hear because it's about the flesh. I feel, oh, I've got power. I've got all these things. But it's not the truth. The word of God, as plain as it is, it gives life. It says there in verse 49, Jesus your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. So he shows them how wrong their understanding is, exalting the manna, exalting their fathers, exalting this time of Moses in the wilderness above all these other things. And he's telling them, manna is only for this life. Understand that manna was not an eternal thing. Manna is only a picture of the true bread that was coming into this world and the one who's standing right before you now. Verse 50, he says, this is the true bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the true bread, guys, is what he's saying to them. Jesus proclaiming himself as that nourishment from God. Verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus has life in himself and he gives life to those who come to him. He says, if anyone eats of this bread, it's awesome. Because to eat of Jesus, we know it means to believe in him. He says, the bread that I shall give is my flesh. So how does Jesus become the bread of God? He is pointing forward to the cross. We just went through Passover season now, where his body was broken, just like bread as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, when we receive salvation, we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's what it means. John 13, 20, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives me, receives him who sent me. This is the truth. 
Jesus came from heaven to give his life for our salvation. This is a spiritual reality. He says to give for the life of the world, not just for the Jews, not just for the elite or for the elect out there, for the whole world. Verse 52. The Jews therefore quarrel among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So now they were angry. They were not happy because when they heard this, that he said, you should eat my flesh. They were completely upset. And there's a war of words going on now. There's a dispute among themselves. You see, Jesus is talking about spiritual things, but like always, these guys are stuck in the physical plane. Just like the woman at the well in John chapter 4, just like the disciples, oftentimes Jesus spoke about spiritual things, and guess what? The people tried to understand them physically. He says, how can he give us his flesh to eat? How is it possible physically? No, it's not possible because that's not what he's saying at all. He was, as usual, using a physical thing to teach them a spiritual truth, to make it more comprehensible for them. You know, think about just like Adam and Eve ate us out of fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden. That's really what happened. Now he says, by partaking, by eating of Jesus Christ, you can be restored into that fellowship with God and brought back. But when he talks about his flesh, you must understand the Jews were forbidden to eat anything with blood. So when he says, drink my blood, eat my flesh, culturally, they were completely freaking out. Genesis 9 verse 4, God commanded it. The life is in the blood. You shall not eat the blood. But the thing is, they were so thrown by what he was saying, they were not hearing what he was trying to tell them. And that brings us to point number two. If you're taking note, point number two, not hearing Jesus. Look there at verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he's talking about spiritual life. Why? The book of Hebrews gives us such a great understanding. Hebrews 10 verse 4 tells us, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away our sins. You see, all men since Adam has been born dead in trespasses and sins, it tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 1. We need to be made alive. You cannot make a sacrifice to receive eternal life. You see, sacrifice is an important concept. Sacrifice in the Old Testament under the Jewish law, just like the manna, was something that had to happen over and over and over again. It could never put away sin. Every time you sin, you have to sacrifice again. Where the difference is with Jesus, the living bread, he came once for all. Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 9 verse 11 to 12, it says Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's why our Lord is so great. Verse 54, he says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's why if you have Jesus, you have life eternal. It's not just knowing about Jesus, it's partaking of Jesus. It's becoming one with Him. You know, it's the same issue with bread. If you see bread, a slice of bread or a piece of bread lying there on a plate, if you, even if you acknowledge, hey, that is bread there in the plate, it doesn't help you at all. It's only when you take the bread, you eat of it, and it becomes nourishment for your body, you get what you must get out of the bread in the same way. You can, just by saying, I believe that Jesus exists. I believe that Jesus is God. That doesn't save you. You need to partake of him to believe everything the scripture says and line your life up with the word of God for it to take place. It has to be a partaking. It has to be a relationship. And then Jesus says, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is the promise that comes with this. And that's our blessed hope, you know, that we wait for him to come to us again. Verse 55, he says, For my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. So, not literally, is drinking is physical blood. That's the false teaching of transubstantiation. Some people teach that, that, you know, 
that's not what we believe at all. That's not biblical. Spiritually, he's talking spiritually about the life that we get through the blood, receiving it by faith as we believe in him. And he contrasts this with all the food and the drink of this world. You know, with all the cake out there, Jesus says, I am the true food. You can run from cake to cake. You will never be satisfied. It will be a temporary sugar rush for you maybe, but you'll only find sustenance in the word of God. Verse 56, he says, you eats my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me and I in him. When you live in me, Jesus says, then I also live in you. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. You see, the Father gives life, and now the Son gives life also to those who come to him. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. You see, this is a huge difference. This is the key really here. He says, I am the real bread, guys, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He says, your fathers ate manna. You are speaking about them so highly. Where are they? They're all dead. <laughs> Think about the fathers. Did they even get into the promised land? No, they didn't. Why? Because of unbelief, the Bible tells us. They couldn't, even though they saw the manna every day, for all that time in the wilderness, they couldn't enter the promised land because of unbelief. The manna could not save them. He says, he who eats this bread that I'm offering you will live forever. The bread that I'm talking about, guys, he says, is a different kind of bread that gives you true eternal life. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. In the synagogue. So this is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. They're in Capernaum. And it's interesting because they're sitting in a synagogue, which is a consecrated place for studying the Word of God. And the living God is there, and He's telling them the truth of God, but they are not hearing Him at all. It's so sad. Number three, if you're taking note, rejecting Jesus. Look there at verse 16. Therefore, many of the disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand that? Who? You know, not only the Jews at this stage, there's a much greater group of followers that's been following after Jesus. They're all crowding this synagogue area now right there to follow him. So also, there are the greater group of the disciples among them. Those who have been following Jesus everywhere he went. Not the 12, not the apostles, but the greater group of disciples. And these guys were all with him until the moment he says, drink my blood. And they're like, they lost it. They lost it completely. They're like, this is crazy, man. We don't want to hear any more of this. But the thing is, we have to understand what Jesus was saying was not so hard to understand as it was hard to accept, to believe. We find the same thing in our own lives. What do you do when you're reading your Bible and God uses a verse to speak to you very directly. It just hits you in the heart. Punches you sometimes in the gut. You go like, ah! Oh, I hear the word of God, but what am I going to do with it? You know, you know what God's saying to you? You hear exactly what he says, but you think like, man, that is so tough. How am I supposed to do that? That's a tough one for me to swallow. And the question is, what do you do? Do you just say, ha, huh, it's too hard for me, and you walk away? Or do you say, Lord, help me to understand this really by your spirit. Lord, help me to do your word. You know, I remember quite a few times in my life where God pointed to some idol that was in my life on the throne of my life that shouldn't be there. And guess what? Every time that God shows you some truth from his word, sometimes it's hard to hear. Why? Because we like the flesh. We like sin. We like our idols. And so sometimes God says, that thing. And you're like, ah, that hurts. I don't want to hear that. But the question is, what do you do? I always think about Abram. He's one of my Old Testament heroes. Abram, you know, in Genesis 22 verse 2, it says, God said to him, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. By the way, that's the son that has been promised to him. He's been waiting for the son for like a hundred years. And God says, 
your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I shall tell you. Now you think like, how hard is that? Does God even ever tell you something like that? That's a hard one to hear. So the question is, what did Abraham do? Did he just say, ha, it's too hard, I can't do that, God, and he just left it? No. You know what Abraham did? That's why he's a father of faith. He obeyed no matter how hard it was because he knew that it was God who was speaking to him by his word. He knew this is the word of God, so what can you do? This is the truth. Listen to this verse, Genesis 22 verse 3. It says, So Abram rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took Isaac his son. This is the next morning. God spoke to him the previous day, say, go offer your son. Abram was like, ah, oh, it's the worst thing in the world for him to hear. The next morning, early, he got up early, he saddled his donkey, and he obeyed God in what God asked of him. You see, this is the only way for us to grow in a spiritual life, to mature in faith. When we trust God when He speaks to us and to take what He says, not just to say, oh God, it's hard, but to take it into our hearts and say, Lord, apply this thing to my heart, even though it is hard to and difficult to hear. Look at verse 61. When Jesus knew in Himself that His disciples complained about this, He said to them, does this offend you? He asked him straight out. Jesus is not fearful about any man. He doesn't want to just make everyone happy. You know, the Greek word there for the word offend, it's the word skandalizo or the word skandalon. It means to scandalize. Jesus says to them, listen, guys, is what I'm saying stumbling you? Because we know even to this day, the cross of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block for many Jews. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. You see, today people are so cautious not to say anything that might offend anyone else. We live in this crazy age of tolerance where no one speaks any truth because it may just be too difficult for someone else to hear. Isn't that an effective way for the enemy to cut us off from hearing truth, from getting saved? The fact is, the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to this world because it's the only way of salvation, because it speaks against the flesh. It says you cannot save yourself by your, your own effort. It says you are not good. You need God so that he can come and change you by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and then you will be accepted by the Father in the stead of Jesus Christ and on his behalf. You see, but no matter how they receive it, this is truth. No matter if it's something they don't want to hear, this is truth and saying it to them is the only loving thing you can do. Because there's no other way to be saved, the Bible makes it very clear. You see, if your neighbor's house is on fire, and you're going to say, well, you know, I don't really want to offend my neighbor. I sort of like him, and, and I don't want to tell him that his house is on fire because he might take it wrong. I don't want to try and call him out because I think it's unsafe there, so I'm just going to leave him. And you're going to let your neighbor burn to death. No, of course not. You're going to run to the door and slam and bang on the door until he opens that door for you. And you're not going to care what he thinks. You're just going to say, run out, buddy. Come, come, run for your life. And that's the difficulty today. People don't want to offend, and so they don't really give the truth of the word to anyone. Verse 62. Jesus says, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? He's telling them, If you have a problem with me saying this to you, then what are you going to do when I'm going to die on the cross in a few days? When I'm going to Go into the grave, I'm going to rise on the third day, and eventually I'm going to ascend into heaven. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to happen when you see Jesus in his glory as the judge of the world? How are you going to handle that then? You see, it's better to be offended now and to deal with it than to find out the truth when it is too late. Verse 63 says, it is the spirit who gives life. Listen to this, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. You see, is it spiritual decisions or fleshy decisions? It's so important to consider that in our life every single day. The true life is in the spirit, it's not in the flesh. That is our verse, Zechariah 4.6, the second part. 
not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. If only the church of God really believed that. I wonder how much energy and enthusiasm we have wasted in our flesh, in our self-reliance. You know, we think like, we're going to do this for God. We're going to do this. We're going to come up with a strategy, with this plan. You know, simply give the word of God. This is the only thing that really works. The answer is not think tanks. The answer is not in men. The answer is not in being clever. The answer is in the word of God by the power of his spirit. And so Jesus continually calls us to put our heart and our focus on the spiritual reality and not on the fleshly things of this world. He says, the words that I speak are spirit and life. You see, he draws them right back to the word of God that is living and powerful, Hebrews 4.12. The thing that God's been really trying to tell them from the beginning, if you think back all the time to the time of Moses that they were so excited about, God was saying the same thing to them at this time. Listen to Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. It says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make known to you that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You see, God's been saying the same thing all along. Now Jesus tells them the same thing as the living word of God. Verse 64, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. You see, it's not their inability to believe, that is their stubbornness, it's their unwillingness to believe, just like their fathers in the desert. But Jesus knows all things. From the beginning, he knew that some of them will not believe, that many of them will not believe. And he said, therefore, I have said that to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. I told you, unless you're really listening to God and hearing from him, you're not going to come to me. God is the one. If you keep seeking me for worldly things like bread, then you're coming to me for the wrong reasons and you're not hearing what I'm trying to tell you. And then we read this sad verse, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. This is the unfortunate reality of the truth of the word of God sometimes. Many people who sought him at the beginning, including now a lot of these larger group of his disciples, now they left. They're saying, this is too hard. This, I can't, no, I can't do that. And so they leave him. And this was going all so well. If you think according to man, verse 24, it says, they were seeking Jesus. Verse 28, it says they wanted to do God's work, but then things changed just like that. Verse 41, it says they complain. Then verse 52, they quarrel among themselves. Verse 60, they're saying this is a hard saying, and now in verse 66, they left. Why? Because you can't come to God in any way that you want to. You cannot come to God on your terms. You need to come to God in His way. That's, that's, that's the only way. You need to receive Jesus Christ as Lord, and you need to receive Him as a Savior. There's no other way to be in a relationship with Him. You know, Acts 4.12 tells us so clearly, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That means you cannot be saved in any other way. That includes any other religious system. It includes Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam. It includes the Mormons and it includes the Jehovah's Witnesses. It includes so many, all these religious systems. You cannot be saved by a religious system. You can only be saved by the living word of God, Jesus Christ. And so the question is, does this offend you? Is this too hard for you to accept? You say, well, I think all roads lead to God. Well, is that your opinion or God's opinion? You say, well, I cannot be because I know this guy. He's a Muslim and he's such a good guy. Sure, it's, it's not about the personality of the guy. It's about if he is good enough according to God's standards. And there's only one way that you can become good enough. That is by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And you know what? Even if this may be hard to hear for many, this is the only truth. 
This is love by telling them the truth because it's the only way that they can be saved from eternal destruction. Verse 67, then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? So Jesus tells them, guys, you want to leave too? <laughs> it's amazing because Jesus is not afraid. Jesus didn't come to this earth for, to win a popularity contest. He didn't come so people may like, oh, he's so, he's so wonderful in the flesh as, a, as the Messiah. He came to give life to those who really seek him. His focus is not earthly, physical, bread. His focus is eternal life. Jesus knows the truth already, but what he asks helps us to examine our own motives in following him. You see, the truth of God's word always brings us to a choice. We'll find that. Either you're going to have to say, well, Lord, I accept, I believe, and I'm going to obey, therefore, because this is what you said in the word, or you're going to say, well, I reject it and go away from it. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, if you abide in my word let's live in my word you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free you see his word is truth but the truth only sets you free if you accept it if you partake of it if you make it your own if it becomes part of your life not only if you know it if you know there's a cliff, and you're going to fall down there, but you don't do anything with that knowledge. It's not going to help you. It's only when you apply it, only when you partake of it. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. This is one of the best things Peter ever said. He's like, Lord, to who else shall we go? Who else is there, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, we may not always know what you're saying. We have seldom have understanding at this stage. But Lord, we know who you are. We believe that you are the word of God and that, you know, we have to understand there's no middle ground. Either Jesus Christ is the living word, as he says, either he can give us life or he cannot. There's nothing in between. Either Jesus is right or he's wrong. There's no middle ground in this. He says, further, also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he says another two important things here. He says, Jesus, we believe that you are the Messiah, the promised one. You know, the Jewish Mashiach, the one who was promised to them. But then they make, he makes a very important connection there. He says, also, we know that you are the Son of the living God. He says, we've come to believe that the Messiah is also the very Son of God. It means He is the very God Himself. You are God, Jesus, right here in front of us now, the one who has been promised to us. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? You think like, you know, how does this fit right here into the context? Because what Jesus was saying, Jesus knows everything ahead of time. And so he's saying, Peter, I appreciate that you feel so strongly about this. You know the truth. But Peter, don't make the mistake of speaking on behalf of all 12. You don't know the reality. You don't know the hearts. I know the hearts, and I know there's a devil among us right here. It says in verse 70, He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the 12. You see, they couldn't discern it here. The Bible calls Judas the son of perdition, according to John 17, 12. Because Satan entered him, and then he went and betrayed Jesus, did this terrible thing that he could never walk away from again. The thing we have to understand, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is simple, it is straightforward. In him is life. Without him, there is no life whatsoever. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the second part, he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, God loves the world. That's a fact. He's drawing the world to himself through the word of God, through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, through preaching and teaching what Jesus did. John 3, 16, God loves the world. The big question is, will you accept this truth or will you reject this truth that's up to you you're gonna have to decide for yourself 
You see, Jesus will never force you. He'll give you the truth, and he'll give you the truth over and over again, but he will never, ever force you to believe him. He will never force you to do what he wants you to do. He'll give you the truth, and you have to accept it. You have to decide, but don't put off this decision. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you have not personally received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to do that today. You don't know when you may die. We live in very uncertain times. A lot of people are dying from this coronavirus. I'm not saying this, well, if I say that to scare you, to give you the fear of God, that's a good thing. But you need to know the truth. You are going to die. And what's going to happen then? There's only one way to be saved eternally, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news is eternal life is available freely in Jesus Christ, but only in Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, who is the Son of God. So let's just take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, I want to praise you for the wonderful work of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. I want to thank you, Lord, for saving us in Jesus Christ, everyone who believes, everyone who comes to you, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that it's a free gift. We know we cannot work it. We cannot deser deserve it. We cannot earn it in any way. We thank you, Lord, that you did what no man could ever do for himself. We thank you for eternal life that is available in your word by believing this word. And I want to pray, Lord, that you'll work in our hearts as a fellowship also, as the people who are listening to this. Lord, I want to pray that you will change our hearts, that we'll have new eyes as we look to your word. Lord, that we will not look to men to get our answers from them, that we will not look to opinions of men. Father, but we'll simply look to your word and that we'll be saved and be with you eternally. Thank you, Lord, that you do draw us. You never leave us. You keep telling us the truth even if we don't want to hear it. And I thank you, Lord, that you don't give up. I thank you that your word goes out to accomplish what you sent it to do. And so, Father, I want to pray in Jesus' name. May you be with us, Lord. May you guide us and lead us by the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you in the week ahead. And may you walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. May you not trust in the flesh of man. Amen.